Hi, my name is Patricia Kathleen, and this podcast series will contain interviews I conduct with women, female-identified, and non-binary individuals regarding their professional stories and personal narrative as it relates to their perspective. This podcast is designed to hold a space for all individuals to learn from their counterparts, regardless of age, status, or industry. We intend to transparently investigate the evolving global dialogue regarding underrepresented figures in all industries across the USA and abroad. By hosting these stories and conversations, we aim to contribute to the changing platform and representation of these individuals for the future. Now let's start the conversation. and welcome back. I am your host, Patricia, and today I am elated to be sitting down with Tamsin Napier-Munn. Tamsin is a speaker, facilitator, and host of Women in Business Awards. She is also the founder and CEO of Raw Talks Academy. You can find out more about these issues and um, some of the stuff we unpacked today at rawtalksacademy.com. Welcome, Tamsin. Hi, lovely to see you. I'm very excited. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to call through everything um, regarding your business endeavors today. And for those of you that are new to this podcast, I'll give you um, a brief roadmap of where our line of inquiry will be uh, headed towards in our 30 to 45 minutes today. Uh, And I will also read a bio on Tamsin before I start peppering her with questions. So the roadmap for today's podcast, we'll first look at Tamsin's academic and professional background and history, leading her to the Raw Talks Academy and um, her work within that, as well as hosting of the Women in Business Awards, um, some of those efforts. Then we will look towards um, unpacking those efforts in general, um, the logistics of when each was founded, the work that each is doing, all of that. And then we will turn our efforts towards goals that Tamsin has for all of those projects, namely the Raw Talks Academy over the next one to three years. And we'll wrap everything up with advice that she has for those of you who are looking to get involved or perhaps emulate some of her success. So as promised, prior to um, getting into my line of inquiry, a quick bio, Tamsin is an enthusiastic, skilled, and energetic speaker and facilitator whose business acumen and engaging style ensures that sessions are not only highly relevant, but have a lasting positive impact. Tamsin's eternal optimism for people and opportunities have helped drive her uh, determination to successfully navigate her way through, like many people, a far from sight forward upbringing and career path. Having, a highly, having had a highly successful sales and career in B2B fashion, publishing, and IT, Tamsin transitioned into training sales teams and management and led a regional Dale Carnegie training business as host of the Women in Business Awards and campaigned for the last five years for the business magazine. Tamsin is a passionate about tapping into the power in us, pushing through doubts, and taking charge of our careers and our lives. As a result of her experience and determination to learn to speak up and step in and step up, Tamsin has been inspired to reach out to those of us who haven't yet found our voice, um, our voices to find the courage and skills to get seen and get heard. In 2019, Raw Talks Academy was launched, pioneering programs for people of influence. Tamsin has designed strategies, steps, and processes as a part of a system to empower you to develop real confidence and real influence and have real impact on your career and business. By tapping into your personal power, you will have a life with greater passion, purpose, and will truly unlock your potential. Um, Make what you say matter because what you say matters, uh, is a quote from Tamsin Napier-Munn. So Tamsin, I do um, I do want to drop straight into everything that you're doing. However, prior to that, I'm hoping that you can kind of unpack for us um, your history, your academic background, and early professional life that led you to what you're doing now. Ooh, that's a long story, but I'm sure everyone's got a lovely, lovely long story to tell. So, you know, I, I really didn't have much of an academic um, yeah. background, so we can s- swiftly go past that one. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I, I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't engage in school. I was artistic. Um, and I think I had ADHD then, but I don't think people really understood it. But also, I had quite a dysfunctional and fairly abusive childhood. So my focus was very much on self-preservation. And part of that was I wasn't really allowed to speak. So I was very much metaphorically gagged as a child. And so I kind of lived in my head for a lot of time. So I went into sixth form college. 
And before I went into art college, which I dropped out of, I have to say, um, I had anorexia, like a lot of young girls, you know, really struggled with your sort of mm. uh, uh, identity and all the rest of it. And so it took me years and years to start to, um, I guess, un undo a lot of the self-esteem issues. But that was probably the reason why I kind of dropped out of college. I went to art college. I wanted to be a fashion designer and uh, uh, thought that was the path to go. So, um, but unfortunately I didn't finish it. I don't think my parents were too impressed, but hey, um, so that's, that's my academic background. Yeah. Well, so, and that's interesting because I frequently find in people that I speak to, um, particularly women or female identified or non-binary individual, that doesn't necessarily denote, you know, a very prolific and um, um, like a widely cast net as far as the professional life is concerned. You know, inquiry during that time period happens at any stage, regardless of the institution one finds themselves in. So how did you start your professional life? Well, interesting, you know, it, I think it teaches you, I mean, to, to, when you go through stuff, it teaches you resilience, determination. Mm -hmm. And I know, although I fell out of college, um, I still wanted to be a fashion designer. I kind of went up, it's sort of one of those romantic stories or not of running up to London, um, and finding my fame and fortune, but unfortunately found it probably in the wrong places and found myself with the wrong, with the wrong people. And just one morning, early morning, when I was coming back from one of those all-nighters, uh, I was passing the rag trade in, in London and I happened to peer into the window of this fashion house and this chap came out and we got chatting and offered me a job and in those, you know, at that point, uh, it was simply a gopher job. I was, I was hanging clothes and gopher here and gopher that, gopher this. Um, but I was earning 35 pounds a week. It was wow, you know, yeah. uh, not a lot, but I was willing to learn. And uh, I then went to work for Philip Green, the infamous Philip Green who owns Topshop. And uh, that was an experience, I think baptism by fire with that gentleman. Um, and he, you know, I don't know whether we're sort of jumping into a defining moment in our lives, but, you know, that kick-started my career in sales because although I wanted to be a fashion designer, I ended up talking to clients, selling clothes from the racks and uh, to the wholesalers, to Topshop. I found I had a knack of, of influencing and how to understand people and relate and connect. So... I remember Philip Green once turned around to me and said, Tamsin, if you had brains, you'd be dangerous. And I remember thinking, I don't think that was a compliment. Mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but it gave me a real drive to sort of say, okay, that I'll show you moment. And yeah. I, from that moment on, I, my career started to kind of go forward, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to make money. And the reason being is I wanted to be financially independent. I think a lot of women that I have met who perhaps haven't had a secure background have just been driven to feel that financial security and independence that they haven't had. Yeah. So that was my drive more than anything else. So I went into sales more and more into the fashion industry in the eighties. So that was in the boom time in the fashion business went into the footwear business industry. So you can, I had a very, what they call a squiggly career. I mean, I did have no plan, no idea what I was doing. And so I went into the fashion footwear business with my cousin and I became a sales manager at the age of 21. And I was driving right around the country, selling off samples. I mean, you talk about hard work and, and just yeah. to the grindstone. I mean, I, I was really working hard. I made some good money. Then I flipped into the publishing industry. I mean, can you, you couldn't get more sort of, well, apart from, you know, photographs and um, fashion, of fashion. I went into publishing. I was headhunted, so to speak, for, mm. to start a contract publishing arm. And I ended up selling that advertising space the hard no sales kind of environment with guys, about 90% of them were guys sitting in a room smoking in those days. Yeah. Um, off to the pub at lunchtime and I'd go off with them, you know. I think, you know, then 
just to kind of short circuit a lot of this, I, I bumped around, I suppose, rode the quest of the wave, of each wave of whether it was fashion, because then in the 80s we had the, we had the, the crash, yeah. then we had, um, you know, publishing was on the up and there was all sorts of wonderful things I went to, sporting events, hospitality, it was just fun. And then I went into IT. So, you know, when the dot-com boom started and, you know, actually when DOS was, was around, I was, I was one of the first people in the software training industry working for a franchise in London from Atlanta and Georgia, actually. So I headed that up for the, the sales team in London and then the UK. I found I was, you know, again, honing my skills or as a salesperson. And I ended up training some of the people in sales around me. Mm. And again, it was the dot-com boom time, Patricia. It was, you know, the time when it, you couldn't not make money. I mean, I had yeah. no idea about technology and still don't, if I'm honest. And, but I just knew how to connect with people. So that was, that was then. Um, um, so where are we? So the dot-com boom and bust. And then I had previously taken a Dale Carnegie course uh, when I was 21. And it had just, just changed my whole view on me as well so this is where I started believing in myself because somebody else believed in me more than I did and I so what is the Dale, Car Dale Carnegie course for everyone the knows. Dale Carnegie of course is American um was, he wrote the book how to win friends and influence people back in in mm -hmm. oh, 1936 I think it was and it's still probably one of the, the most prolifically read books and so valid now still and what it did is it gave me tools and the confidence because it's all around public speaking and that's you know yeah. when you talk about where did my where did raw talks perhaps start it started way back mm -hmm. you know this is the perfect storm it kind of came to fruition because of a number of events coming to, together but it started and my ability to start to speak up to find my voice which is what I didn't have for many years since I was a child, to realize that actually I could influence and I could speak and I could have the courage to um, put myself out there. And so it boosted my confidence. So at the same time of when I joined the technology company, uh, the training company, uh, it, my, my career just flew and yeah. I was having you know, a lot of fun. My confidence was there. But I think, you know, um, you know, when things are built on rocky foundations, you know, the cracks in the mortar of the building can start to show. Mm -hmm. And as you, if you don't dig those root, those foundations out and rebuild. And that's, that's simply what happens after a while. I was working really hard just to make money. Yeah. I then decided I wanted to go into the training industry full time. So I went to work for Dale Carnegie. I opened the office in Windsor in the, in the UK. And I um, then started to run seminars, which is then when I really found that I loved connecting with people yeah. and speaking up and speaking from the heart and coaching people. And then I don't know how far you want me to go. So shall I... No, I this is on? good. I mean, it does, it does lead way into kind of what you did and how you were doing. Oh. How long did you carry that position? Um, for a few years. It's very bit, bit sort of vague, about a few years. Um, but I have been connected, Patricia, with Dale Carnegie for since, I say, 1988. So you can probably guess my age now. But 1988 to still, I'm partnering with them with Raw Talks as well. Because okay. what they did was fundamentally changed, uh, was, well, the change was permanent. So a number of the things that I'm working with now, best practice, is based on that. Yeah. So, yeah. so before I, unpacking yeah. that, I want to skip over to, because I kind of want to end with unpacking Raw Talks Academy, but I really yeah, yeah. want to get into your hosting of the Women in Business Awards. So really quickly for everyone listening, what is it um, and how long so, you served as the host and how and why were you selected to host those awards? Okay, 
I'll start with the selection, how that came about, because mm -hmm. just very quickly, um, I had my son, things were going well. I was coaching one-to-one, -one, uh, self-employed, and I have been since. And then, and then I got married. I did everything round, ass about face, my mother would call it. You know, I, I did things the wrong way around. I got married after I had my son. Yeah. And, and then not long, you know, it was only a short-lived marriage, got divorced, and that was very painful. So when I said the cracks started to show, that's when they started to show I suffered yeah. from anxiety. I was going through menopause. And I pretty soon realized I was having a nervous breakdown, mm -hmm. which I did, which was, you know, looking at a drawer full of pills that I didn't want to take. There was yeah. a, another defining moment of I had to make a decision to do something. So having met the owner of the business magazine some years before, I got up one day, literally out of my chair, feeling absolutely paralyzed picked up my phone and I phoned him because I had a son who I had to look after no one was paying for him but me and my finances were going backwards and I was stuck and really wasn't sure what I was going to do about it so something just propelled me into action I just got up I phoned uh, David Murray and I said said to David, I think I've got some ideas for you, how you could expand your business ideas with your awards and your events because of my facilitation. And could I have some time with you to show you what I think we could do together? And he agreed and he gave me an opportunity, but not that there wasn't an opportunity there. There wasn't a job. I just created something. I created yeah. a need. And so that's one of the things that I think women, you know, we as women absolutely need to be doing more of is creating a need, seeking it, finding it and filling it rather than waiting until we're asked, until we're ready, until something comes up. So I, I sold myself <laughs> and sold the idea. He then gave me three campaigns to run part-time so I was part-time he was paying me and one of them was the women in business awards now Patricia I had never ever been interested in these women's groups women's stuff um, I think partly because I'd never seen or felt that it, I've had any difficulty with in a man's world perhaps I used dare I say my sexuality my, my you know my charm uh, to my advantage, rightly or wrongly, it worked for me. And most of my clients and my customers were men. So, you know, I, this was alien to me. And it was like ladies who lunch was not my thing. So I was kind of, I'll do it because I like the idea of, of speaking, being in an audience and raising my profile. And I knew that the only way that I raise my profile and start to get noticed for what I do is to... Uh, step forward to grab this opportunity with both arms, which I did. So I started hosting the first one, which was then there was the second year they'd ever done it. And uh, we had lots of sponsors. Uh, it was 2015. And it was the first time I'd been on stage like that, um, you know, in front of two, 300 people. Mm. And it was quite daunting, but I, I really broke a fear there of standing mm -hmm. in front of people um and that's another conversation maybe sometime you know yeah, about uh, you know standing in front of an audience was one of the biggest fears that i ever had like a lot of people i was humiliated as a child in front of my father uh in front of groups of his friends so i you know had this block and i was determined to overcome it so this was a real big one for me so over the last five, year, five and a half years, I've been hosting and growing the campaign. So it's not just the awards, it's the whole writing the newsletters, putting everything on the website, interviewing uh, some really successful, amazing women. And I soon realized, and this is why you know, it's come to this now, is I, I really realized how much women, we as women tend to, I say tend to, not everybody, hold ourselves back. Yeah. You know, 
So um, that got me into the Women in Business Awards and the hosting. So I started to build my profile, uh, make amazing connections, interview lots of amazing women and start to kind of build a picture, not just from my own experiences of what it stands for, what Raw Talk stands for, which I, I can come on to, but the reason for it, uh, the drive for it. Um, but, you know, I started to realize there's a DNA that could be captured of women who are successful to be able yeah. to teach others. I think it's remarkable, too, that you came at it from this, like, you know, you didn't feel incredibly blighted with your career, you know, and based um, with the the gender parity, you know, and disparity issues um, yeah. that so many people talk about. It's a unique and it's a brave platform to have, you know, to say, I didn't really feel it. Maybe I was using things to my advantage, but it worked for me. So I am curious now, can we kind of, um, I'd like you to unpack um, Raw Talks Academy. It was founded recently in 2019, which yeah. I love. Infancy endeavors are so fun. Um, but it sounds like it was born out of like axiomatic principles that you were doing yes. prior to that with the business magazine um, awards and things like that. So um, can you kind of like walk us through how it was developed? Did you also do it in partnership with, um, with the business magazine owner or was this a separate thing? Well, he's been very supportive of it. Uh, and it's, it's sort of a run, run alongside, but it is my own venture. Okay. And so, you know, I think what it comes, so at the core of it is about finding your voice. It is about courage. And it is about three things I did. I, so I, I created a system, Patricia, that I identified. I sort of, I unpacked everything that I had done in my life. So this is, you know, wasn't an overnight success and still isn't, but it's, it's something that I sort of looked at, what have I achieved and how have I done it? How have I overcome things? And to, to then identify those processes and the mindset, the techniques that I use. And at the core of it is those two things, finding your voice and having the courage to act. Now, I think that a lot of you know, women, as I say, tend to, we hold ourselves back waiting to be ready, waiting until we're sure and waiting until we feel like it, waiting to be asked, mm -hmm. uh, waiting until all the lights turn green. We hesitate. We tend to overthink, overanalyze, underestimate our values. So there's so many statistics out there. And I started to read up about how women, you know, have held themselves back because they only go for something unless they're 80. 80% ready or feel that they are 80% ready. You know, someone, a friend of mine said to me, a male friend, he said, you know what? Men have more of a sod it button than women. You know, they have a kind of, they're more willing to kind of go for something. Yeah. And, you know, Raw Talks is, stands for real authentic women. And what I can see in a lot of women, including myself, which is my journey as much as anybody's, is to stop wearing masks, to start to, rather than being fine when everyone says, and how are you? And you say, I'm fine. And we all know what that means. It's fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Or as somebody else has said, is, is feelings inside not expressed. A lot, a lot of women have a voice or they want to, to say something. They have ideas, but they hesitate, waiting to think that, you know, am I gonna be taken seriously? And overlooked for promotion. And it's about time we stepped up, spoke up, and identified these three areas, if you like, that I, I believe that everybody needs to master if they want to get ahead. But in particular, women, you know, this, this is a, a game changer. And that is one is to inspire, the ability to inspire others, the ability to influence others, and the ability to impact change. So all the skills and the processes of the system are geared to support women in doing those three things. Hmm. And I got a lot of inspiration from, uh, so, so at the core of this is I identified one thing that enabled me. And I say enable me, I empowered myself. Because this is one of the things that I, I know that a lot, uh, I'll come back to this, but I, I sat at the, an awards evening once and this guy said to me, young guy, he said, you know what, 
women have got to stop pointing the finger at everybody else and saying they've got to change. You know, they they've got to, and I and I and I just looked at him, uh, knowing I was hosting the women in business. He knew that, so hence he he brought it up. Sure. I I looked at him and I said, Do you really? And he said, women have really got to be the change. They've got to be that that influence rather than waiting for other people to change. And I thought he's absolutely right. How I have never, it reminded me of my career, I'd never waited for everybody else to change, but I had to be that influence, that change in me. So I, I truly believe that they talk about empowering women. This is the, this is the you know, subtitle to everything, women empowerment and how companies are empowering women. And they don't, how can they? They can allow them to do, to empower themselves. But only women can take charge to give themselves the authority to change. So my system is ultimately the ultimate self-empowerment, personal power empowerment system, because it's women taking charge for themselves uh, and you know, wait, not waiting till, yeah. till they're given permission to. And, and that to me is how we can make change happen at a, on a large scale. So the system, the academy is, is about to teaching women the skills, the courage, and ultimately um, to help them to find their voice and use it. So the core of this is, a, is, a, is a, something I call the, the power of three activation formula. It was inspired, I have to say, by Mel Robbins, her five second rule. However, comma, I realized there was, there was a, like a, a different process to this. And actually five seconds, it takes me three seconds to, to talk myself out of something. And hmm. if you can actually get out of your head into action uh, and you can get out of your head and uh, without overthinking things in a way that is um, quick, that engages, so I talk about, you know, you're locked in mental jail. For me, this lockdown for a lot of people has been mental lockdown. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I put myself in solitary confinement in my head for a long time. And what we have to do is to, to um, break out of mental lockdown and to get into action rather than par being paralyzed by fear and anxiety. Yeah. And as I was, so the, the, Power of three activation formula, I teach the core of everything. So it is a formula, a three-step process of becoming present and really being aware of your instincts. So being aware of the instincts to act. So whether you, you know, have an idea and you're about to put your hand up in a meeting and you have that instinct to do that, rather than what a lot of people do is to kind of whoa put the brakes on and say should I put my hand up should mm -hmm. I say something and the moment's gone rather than that is to to follow your instincts and to count backwards three two one and act physically move so the physical movement changes your mindset you know as as Mel talks about is engaging you know your prefrontal cortex so that you can actually make those physical changes in that moment in those few seconds and act and you know that's probably one of the drivers that most people will say from the testimonials you might see is you know suddenly got rid of the excuses is to act on instinct to honor your instincts with deliberate action so uh that if you like is the power of three which is at the core of everything and i think that is uh for me the uh, the thing that I look back at, yeah. so that's what's caused the changes in my life. Yeah, and I'm curious about, so I, I, I had the opportunity to read some um, uh, pieces, some comments and testimonials from your previous clients, and it sounds like um, a, con a continuous theme is that they all feel like you have offered them a, you know, a, a roadmap to self-empowerment. Yeah and also that you yourself lead by example, that you're this very powerful speaker and things of that nature. And it caused me to kind of consider your client um, profile even further. And I'm curious if yeah. you have noticed any trends that um, even prior to officially launching, you know, um, Raw Talks Academy, 
do you find that you have like a very niche or specific profile of individual that you work with or does it span all industry and genre? Like how does that work for you? Have you It's ever a good question. It? Yeah, I, it's a good question, Patricia. I, uh, the profile of my clients is women. I mean, that is the main profile of my clients. I'd say from... I've identified that everyone suffers from the same things to a smaller or greater degree. And it's not just women who are returning to work after a career break who lack confidence. It is potentially women who are starting out in their career as graduates. A lot of women tend to still have those, those fears and those doubts. and not sure where that's come from whether that's a biological or um, nurture or nature. You know, there's a lot to be said for looking into all of that. There's also uh, the aspiration. I'd say aspirational women are my, my target audience. Anyone who is looking to influence, looking to find their voice, wanting yeah. to get ahead, and is willing to commit to doing something and, and confronting situations. And part of this course and the program the 12-week program that I'm now I'm now launching uh, next month is a pilot what I piloted last year and very powerful program because it starts off with the first eye which is inspiration mm. now everybody wants to needs to inspire others around them and I talk about inspiration rather than motivation because inspiration is the, the rocket fuel for anything for yeah. any endeavor and if women want to to raise their profile they want to be seen uh to be more influential they first need to look at themselves and be inspirational and so that's one of the things that women tend that i found tend to do is they downplay their assets their mm. strengths so what i do is confront them with looking at what they've got going for them you know that's reminding them rediscovering that that part of them that they yeah. they realize is is uh, a strength and i take them through a five-step process of self-discovery and that when they come out of that and it's experiential it's not a theoretical process uh so my coaching just to kind of the way it works and why it's so transformational is that i use best practice coaching in the sense of I use specific ways of disrupting and challenging their thinking yeah and then I, I do a lot of coaching in the moment so for my Dale Carnegie days it's all about stand and deliver or maybe nowadays it's sit and deliver on online but um, stand and deliver uh, is about building confidence through public speaking so I coach them in the moment so that they can actually feel the transformation and I challenge them to be better, be bold, be brave. And so I take them out of their comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. This is where the magic happens, I say. And you're right, it's, it's, it's something that I haven't, I haven't by any means got to where I want to be, but also I'm, also I'm also very conscious, this is my journey too. I struggle and I'm very honest about it. I'm very transparent, like you said, you are transparent. You know, very honest. This is about being authentic, yeah. about being vulnerable, and being brave to be doing that. And the only way that you can inspire and connect with other people is by being those things. So that's what the program teaches. And uh, you know, this is, this is I struggle, just yeah. as everybody else does. Still, to that and like you being very akin and you know human, much like your clients, um, I'm wondering how it be your process sounds very much so like it's about self identity awareness and then these lily pad action item approaches as to how to change through yep. you know, the eyes through inspiring and um, and and impacting and all of those things. But I'm wondering um, to that end, it sounds like you know it's it's kind of micro goal making to kind of get your behavior to change. And with you yourself, as you likened yourself to your clients just now, um, do you find yourself transforming um, as the, the time goes on that you continue to kind of coach people in this? Do you find your theories um, kind of retaining or accelerating in their clarity 
And if so, how is that shaping your future goals with what you're going to do with the academy? Okay, so what I think you, I've heard you say, because it was a little bit, uh, I've got a noise going on in the background, um, is that because this is evolving, mm -hmm. is, that, is that really what yeah. you're, you're yeah. saying? Is, so I'm asking yeah. if, the, if, if you have evolved as an advisor to your clients, and if so, has that changed the future of where you're headed? I think, you know, what well, I'm very excited about the fact that I don't have to be the person standing up there and, and, and Patricia, this is probably, you know, you, you've hit the nail on the head. I see, and I talk about the other women they see, they, they'll go to talks, they'll listen to some very well-known, uh, whether it's Michelle Obama, whether it's Oprah Winfrey, or they'll have some iconic people over in the UK, business women, they'll go and listen to. And they'll get inspired, but the inspiration tends to disappear, tends to sort of um, weaken as they leave the auditorium or they leave yeah. that because what they're saying to themselves is, I could never be like that. So what I want from this academy is, is about storytelling, about hearing other women's stories in a way that is about and sharing it with passion and purpose to inspire other women, saying, I'm not nothing special. Um, this is my story. And, but this is where I've come from. So for me, it's about the ordinary, I say ordinary, exceptionally ordinary woman who has an extraordinary capacity to uh, share their the golden kind of nuggets of wisdom that are being hidden because they haven't had the courage or confidence to speak up. So this is about, so they learn to tell story to, about storytelling. So every session that, that they work through is they tell a story. So they learn how to frame it. They learn how to deliver it with passion yeah. and purpose. And finding their purpose is part of this is, is when you've got that and you've got inspiration, yeah. you know you become unstoppable so so the, the the sort of final icing on the cake for the raw talks academy will be something i'm launching next year hopefully uh it'll be something that if we can all go back on stage quite an amazing uh national program and it's about sharing um watching people's journey from uh from being sort of perhaps less confident person to being an inspirational speaker and seeing that person transform because that's what inspires people. Not maybe the, the Michelle Moans or the Karen Brady's we have over here who yeah. kind of been there, done it. It's seeing someone actually grow. So I hope that people will see me evolve, you know, because yeah. that's puts a, I put a pressure on myself to do that. I have to. I've got to do what I'm asking other people to do. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, at the moment with lockdown, that's exactly what's happened because I'm now transforming it onto an online, live online, and I'm totally out of my comfort zone. This is not where I <laughs> want it to be. Yeah. And so it's another test. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people who can and are able to and um, fortunate enough to receive it that way and do it are growing, you know, and I think yeah. that's one of the offshoots that um, I very timidly tried and proffer up, you know, as, um, as nothing good ever came from pandemic, but um, something good frequently comes from the human struggle, you know, yeah. and, um, and so within that, I think that we can kind of openly talk about those things. And it sounds like you've endeavored with that as well. Well, Tamsin, we're um, running out of time and we're at my favorite part um, for ev everyone who listens to my podcast regularly knows that I am unabashedly honest about the idea that um, this final question of mine, I don't change and, um, and I've asked it of a million people. So I will ask you now today, um, I'm curious if you had a young woman or female identified or a non-binary individual um, approach you in a park or a garden tomorrow uh, at a safe social distance and say, oh, Tamsin, I'm so glad I found you. So check it out. Um, I've had this career that has been this beautifully winding road throughout all of these different industries. I started off, you know, really wanting to be in fashion and was to some degree. And then I climbed through all of these different endeavors. 
I learned through marketing. I was very turned on to this course that I took for, and then worked for. I did all of these different things and now I'm getting ready to um, kind of launch my own enterprise and utilize all of the skills and the, the pieces of knowledge and, and expertise and put it all together. What are the top three pieces of advice you would give that individual knowing what you know now? Okay, so, so did you say top three? Yes. Okay, so I would, um, I would absolutely tell her to find someone who is going to not take any excuses, but is willing to push her because even eagles need a push. Mm -hmm. And the second, the second thing is to, to speak up, mm -hmm. to absolutely speak up and find the courage to do so. I, I would say using this, I would, I would share that three step process with her of the formula because in the moment of making a decision to step outside of your comfort zone, you have to have courage Yeah. and it's about the little things. So it's about having, finding the courage to speak up. And I would say third thing would be, and there are lots of things I would say is about maybe I could squeeze a fourth one in, but to be good sure. to yourself to, and to find your purpose, to, to pursue finding a purpose. And when you do pursue it with all your might, yeah. don't wait until you're my age. <laughs> I think you're killing it. So, and I love age. I've decided I'm, I'm very <laughs> proud. I'm 43. I think that a lot of my audience probably even knows my birthday by now because um, I don't think that you can accomplish what I've accomplished without being around 43. So to pretend to be yeah. any younger would be to be unaccomplished and I would trade yeah. up any day, you know? Um, so I have the, your top three as find someone who won't accept excuses and push you. Number two, speak up and find the courage to do so. And um, number three, be good to yourself and find your true purpose. Yes. I love those. I know you have a million more because I know it's like <laughs> tapping into your zone of genius as to all of that. And so I thought it might be pressing you a bit hard. And I think it was um, beautifully done. I love those. And I want to say, Tamsin, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I know you're busy. Um, everyone is at once thank you. at home and available, but also very busy. And I really appreciate you taking the time and giving us your honest rhetoric. I appreciate you having me and I really enjoyed uh, the time with you. Thank you, Patricia. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, we've been speaking with Tamsin Napier-Munn. You can find out more on rawtalksacademy.com. And thank you for giving me your time today. And until we speak again next time, remember to stay safe and always bet on yourself. Slum check.